let's get started. Um, all right, so now we are officially rolling. Um, thanks for uh, coming, y'all. There are hopefully there will be a few more people. More people are stupid, but that's good. Uh, we are going to talk about Swelt and a bit about Sapper. Uh, I just want to make sure Swelt is the one that is you know completely changes the game and it, it's very exciting. I think the way it does things so much simpler and more powerful. So that's why the tagline is you know simplicity, power, and performance. All three of them, I truly mean it. I mean, I, I put these were I wanted to choose what are the couple of words that I would put on a on a screen to describe Swelt. I think those three, I would say, are the they kind of sum up the the reason why it matters so much. Now, Swelt, I'm sure you guys have researched a little bit. So Swelt is basically uh, a UI framework slash compiler. I would say maybe um, the closest thing, uh, the closest com competitor would be React and Angular and Vue. Okay, so that's how you should understand what it does. But how it does that? That's completely different, and that's where the simplicity, power, and performance comes from. How it it accomplishes that goal. So we will see. We will get into that. So today. Um, Again, I'll be saying things that are more for the benefit of the video recording. So you guys already know me, but I'm Jitesh Doshi and with me, uh, James Pinella and Tyler Trace, uh, Travis uh, will be speaking also. And they have some demos and examples, etc. And, uh, you know, I want to also thank Josh uh, for, you know, being a sounding board for, you know, what what to what is reasonable what is uh, not what is easy to understand what is not what needs more explanation what needs to be covered etc so let's get started um i will start with i'm i'm going to assume although some of you might already have some familiarity with it but i'm just going to start uh, with the uh, you know assumption of non familiarity okay so let's do that sorry I'm going to not, not maximize this. I'm going to start with a, a basic demo of some sort and then we can uh, go from there. Why is this not taking full space? Okay. For some reason, this is not taking up all the space that is available to it, but okay. All right. Anyway, so let's go to Swelt.dev, and in the, at Swelt is created by Rich Harris. He started in uh, I don't know. He must have started long back, but he released it to the world in 2016, late 2016. Uh, Swelt had version two come up in March, April of 20 uh, May of 2018, right? And then version three. Uh, happened in uh, May. Oh, sorry, Ma March or April of 2019, and that one version three is the current version. So it's been out for a year, almost uh, ten months, I guess. And there's a lot of buzz, a uh, lot of excitement, and and I w I believe it's for good reason. If anything, it is under hyped. Uh, very few people actually know about it. Fewer than I I would like. So that's why I'm hosting this just to make sure that everybody's. People have heard of it, but they should get to see the power. So on swell.dev, you will find a tutorial, excellent, excellent tutorial. I literally went through this tutorial and I, everything I, the, oh, I shouldn't say everything, but the 80% of what I know today was learned in the first two or three hours um, of going through this tutorial. That tells you two things. A, the tutorial is good, but the tutorial's job is very easy. I would say because Swelt makes it. Swelt does not add a whole lot of extreme API surface area. Like most other places, you have to remember uh, or at least know the existence of, if not remember the signature of, like 50 functions. If And that is just the API function. I'm not even talking about concepts. In Swelt, you will 
there are maybe four or three or four API functions that you will ever use. In fact, you'll have whole, you'll do whole days of coding uh, where you never used an API function. All you did used was Swell's, you know, syntax and built-in features. And it doesn't extend the JavaScript sy syntax a whole lot. It does extend a little bit. So Swell's API surface area is extremely small. You can see the API, if you click on API, this is the complete specification of Svelte API. Look, look at that scroller uh, on the side. Okay, and by the way, this is not an API specification, this API specification with a lot of examples, okay? And this is the total, all of it. So it's pretty small. This includes examples. So like I was saying, tutorial is what where I started. So I, I would recommend you do that. In the tutorial, as you get deeper in, into it, uh, it goes about on about uh, animation and transition effects and all that. In my first go, I, I skipped it because I don't have direct use for that so much. So I would say, uh, go through the tutorial and skip whatever you know for sure you won't have to worry about. And then from time to time, you will have to go to the API to understand certain behaviors. The API, like I said, in here, this API documentation is very little about API, more about the concept uh, or, or the, you know, compiler feature or something like that. All right, let's see an example. Yeah. Oh, I, I do want it to be very interactive, but uh, yeah, so try to speak l loud enough like I'm speaking, project your voice a little. I w if, if the uh, question is not very clear, I'll repeat it for the benefit of the recording. So, so if you go to the, the first page and where they, you know, set your features. Sorry? If you go to the first page and they try to see what the 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 page. Yes, 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 yes. Oh yeah, this is good. Um the, so they say no virtual DOM. So virtual DOM and React was sold by the benefit. Yes. So how how is it not a benefit? Sell no virtual DOM as a benefit. Correct. Very good question. So here's the answer to that. Um, imagine that you were using a very slow hard drive and then um, people say, oh, uh, so that was state of the art. And then people, somebody, another hard drive vendor comes in, you know what? Our hard drive has cache. You should use our hard drive because it, uh, now we do caching and this and that. Um, and then you will say, yeah, that's good. And this thing is old technology, the disk spins at 100 revolution per minute or something like that, right? And now if I use cache, it really, really improves performance. Absolutely true. Except, Swell comes around, so that's what React said and everybody liked it. Angular was that hard drive, slow, spinning slowly. React said, oh, I'm gonna add virtual DOM, which is sort of a cache kind of thing. It's not exactly, but similar. And then you said, yay, that's great. It's much better. Except then uh, uh, Svelte comes and says, what hard drive and what cache? We can do everything in, in memory and the memory is persistent. So at that point you will say, uh, yeah, I guess I don't need a cache because memory is, is as fast as cache, if not, if not faster. So that was an analogy, but the reality is Svelte basically, the reason why you need virtual DOM is because my, manipulating DOM directly means Every time you make a small manipulation, the layout runs and it keeps running. So in one, um, one render cycle, if you had 50 different modifications to DOM, not only 50 times the DOM will get modified, the DOM will lay out the entire page that many times. That's why it's inefficient to do this. Now, uh, this one, um, the uh, Svelte engine, make surgical changes directly to the DOM. Um, so it will make whatever the actual DOM modification will be uh, probably exactly same as React, except that it doesn't need to batch them up in a virtual DOM. It doesn't need to, um, the reason React has to need a virtual DOM is because it, re, it recreates the, a virtual representation of the entire view uh, in virtual DOM. It needs to do, do that because it recomputes the whole world every time a state variable changes, right? That's why it needs to do that. This guy, Swell doesn't need to do that because it, ha it doesn't recompute the entire world. It, for every variable that you use inside your template, inside your view, it 
builds a context for that and then invalidates that context which means it invalidates only the DOM element that was affected by the change not the entire page and that's how it uh, achieves surgical um, you know modifications to the DOM which is like running like, which is equivalent to applying the virtual DOM to physical DOM so it jumps straight to the last part. Yeah, yeah, but that that limit that is same for everyone in the browser. All APIs have to use the DOM at the last stage. But, but you were saying React was batching your small changes or like doing yeah. optimization on those changes. Correct. It was not doing uh, um, batching. It was not op, uh, batching the DOM changes themselves. It was uh, uh, batching and uh, the virtual DOM changes, right? And then, but it was recomputing the virtual DOM on each of those changes in memory. Here, uh, this guy is compiling your template and your code, so it knows, it does that batching or equivalent of that batching at, com at compile time. It knows how to combine these modifications. So obviously, I cannot go, go much deeper than that because, I, I mean, I'm not like familiar with every line of code in the compiler, but, it, but there are some uh, performance um, benchmarks as well as demos from Rich Harris, which shows that this thing achieves 60 frames per second um, at much higher, uh, you know, modifications, and, you know, more complex view, etc. So they did side by side, and 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 you know, I do be believe that it is faster. And so, so now virtual DOM is not something that the the user, of course, doesn't even know it exists. Even the developer, they know it exists only because it has been hyped so much, right? Uh, otherwise, we shouldn't care. Uh, in Rea originally when when angular was do not using virtual dom and react was that's when you saw some performance improvements right uh, angular was also recomputing the entire page pages layout on every change and that was slowing it down uh, react improved it by doing that in virtual dom but still finally applying the final diff to the physical dom and here uh, they are saying let's just do the surgical diff, uh, diff application directly and you'll see how it does that. So write less code is, so yeah, these three are important. Write less code means uh, there is very little, um, you simply use your variables in your template. We'll see how that works. And then uh, that's it. There isn't a whole lot of syntax that you have to learn. Um, everything feels very natural as if you're just using JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, and less JavaScript at that. And truly reactive means, you simply modify a variable and you will see view re-rendering itself and reflecting the new variable, new value of that state. So let me just show you. Here, if you go to REPL, that's the easiest thing. Um, so this is the simplest example you'll ever see, I guess, in Svelte. Is the font big enough? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so um, all we are doing is a script tag. So this is, first of all, this is a .svelte file. It, Svelte, organizes this component into, into dot .swelt file. Each dot .swelt file contains one, um, only one Swelt component. A Swelt component consists of three things, JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. And the CSS that you uh, put is scoped, meaning to say if you put a style tag, and then you say h1 is color red, then this h1 became red, but it is scoped CSS, therefore, whatever you write here applies only to H1s in this component, or whatever selector you are, it, the selector is already pre-qualified and applied to this current component. If you wanted to apply it to the whole world, you would have to say global, um, uh, sorry. Is it like this, global or something? It's colon. colon global, yes. You would say colon global and then, yeah, and, uh, that's it. Or you, I don't know. So uh, I think there is some syntax like that, right? So this is when you uh, when you are able to affect H1s outside of this component globally, of course. Right? But CSS is scoped. The JavaScript that you write in here becomes a part of the instance method, or you think of it like the render function in React. It becomes a part of that. If you wanted to put your script outside of um, that and in, in the module that contains uh, the 
the component you say script context equal to module again it, there, the, this is kind of uh, only this framework res requests it uh, respects the context equal to module so it is new thing to to know but the syntax is very simple right you're not creating at ng for at sign something colon something else and so on and so forth you know as other framework they invent completely random new things right uh, that's not the case here and then whatever you put here like if you put a new function this uh, this function you will get uh, you know if you're importing this component you would say import let's say you would um, let's say it's in hello dot um, app dot swell right so you import app dot swell sorry app from app dot swell yeah so this is what you would do to import the component itself but if you wanted to import this my funk you simply say this okay so because my funk is a separate export from oh i forgot to export it i <laughs> yeah yeah you have to export this yeah so this is uh, so, uh, so my funk is a separate exported function uh, but it is at the module level not inside the component because everything inside here is in, at the components instance method or render method so that's how you you would add other non component functionality to the component file and this is used by sapper i have personally myself used it in some cases for certain things we'll we'll see all right so let's get back to this um, simplest hello world example um, all you are doing is let name equal to world which is a local uh, variable in the instance method and then you use that inside your template html template templates use expressions inside single curly braces so it's not dollar sign curly brace which is the string interpolation for java and not double curly braces i think that's the case with who who uses double curly braces i think react uses or uh, angular uses somebody uses single uh, double curlies i think angular yeah. handlebar ember handlebar ember does double curly so this guy uses uh, single curly inside the single curly it's usually a javascript expression and sometimes there are directives that we will talk about later so very simple stuff this is nothing ground breaking this is very simple you just set a variable but what what is more interesting is that these if a variable changes let's say let count equal to 0 right and you have two buttons button and the label is count colon oh what under that so you, let's say we say count is equal to count so and then let's create two buttons uh, one for increment and one decrement and uh, this one it'll say on colon click so this is new syntax uh, and then you get an event object which you are ignoring and we are just creating an inline lambda function here and we will say count plus plus similarly we have another this REPL, by the way, is obviously doing a real-time reflection of what we are doing. And this will we will call decrement. We got two functions, uh, two buttons, increment, decrement, and they are doing different things. And look, I am incrementing, it's going up, and I'm decrementing, it's going down, it's being rendered. Now, what is missing from this picture? There is no use state, there is no call to tell um swelt that please re-render there is uh, no complex object all i did was create a local variable and um, there's in behind the scenes there is no virtual dom so how is this working it's working because let me remove this hello world from this i want to show you a very uh, what's going on behind the scenes in this is this here you can see js output and you will notice that uh, all it does is increment and decrement is happening here this is the instance method this is the code that swell generated of course there is some other stuff but this is fu fixed it's just oops what did i just do shoot i lost lost everything i'm sorry 
I hit back by mistake. My bad. Okay, so, um, all right, but you got the point. The point is, I didn't have any any set state, there was no, no use state, there were no hooks, nothing. It's just basic, simple. simple. So that's what I mean. Let's do something. Uh, another thing is asynchronous. If you wanted to do async, say set timeout, so I can make an Ajax call and James will show in, in detail, but I wanted to show you something very, very basic, very, very simple, right? And that would be set timeout, let's say. So you say, um, I want to show uh, something in async mode. So five seconds later, do something. Do what? Uh, set, set name to uh, Jax, Jacksonville. Okay, that's it. Wait five seconds. And we are in Jacksonville. So the point, again, in, in to do async stuff, imagine this was a promise or something, right? Uh, you would need in, in, in React, you would need, you know, thunk middle, uh, middleware, thunk, and then uh, dispatch state to prop, di dispatch, uh, or a map state to prop, dispatch to prop. Well, okay, sure, you're not using that anymore with the arrival of hooks, but then you're using other hooks, use effect and use state, and then you're applying, and if you're using Redux, then, you know, of course, things get more complicated and so on and so forth. In Svelte, things are, you know, much simpler. There's very little, um, syntax, new syntax to learn. So we'll, we'll do that. Let's see if, uh, what else I had planned. So yes, so we, we have plain HTML, J JavaScript and CSS. That doesn't mean 100% compatible with what you are, you know, there is some extensions, but those extensions are very, very minimal. Code modifies the state, compiler injects reactivity to that state. So what compiler did was, when, when it saw me modifying name equal to Jacksonville, if you see the, uh, the generated code, there will be a dollar dollar invalidated around just that statement and that's all there is to it. We have, we, yeah, see this? <laughs> this is what I was saying. That's all. That's the only thing the compiler is doing. Okay. I mean, there, it is doing more because it is, there is a context involved. This is the context number zero and where uh, it keeps track of where you are modifying this context number zero variable called name and it puts some reactivity around that. So, so that's what I was saying that compiler you your code modifies the, the state and the modification of state could be either local variables context variables store variables the, and we'll come to those um, or parents pro, uh, is mo parent is modifying the props any of those things uh, is what i call state compiler re detects that at, at build time not at runtime and injects code inside around those modifications uh, such that at runtime, the view will update itself, and it does that uh, without virtual DOM directly modifying the the um, the physical DOM. But it does have the concept of tick. A tick is basically, um, I think they said it uh, for you can get ticks 60 frames per second. So each frame, each update is bashed into a tick, uh, which allows you to modify things. Um, variables and not cause you know n number of DOM changes immediately. It, it will uh, re-render DOM only or make the DOM changes only once per tick that kind of a thing. And tick will become useful when you are mo making modifications to the DOM through your not directly but through your code your Svelte code and you for before you do the next thing you want to um, um, let's say you made uh, created an, uh, your your state change caused a new DOM element to appear. Now, if you immediately follow it up by document dot get element by ID or something, it won't work because tick has not run. So you instead what you would do is you would put uh, you would do something like uh, wait for tick await something like that await on tick. and then uh, do, you know, get element by whatever. So this you will have to do as, um, okay. So that's one of the API functions you need to be aware of. And then finally, there is no virtual DOM. So this is, okay. So now let's look at some examples. Templating you saw, asynchronous you saw, and now uh, two-way binding. Two-way binding is 
input um, bind value equal to name. Okay, do that, and now five seconds later, it will it will still get updated just like it. And keep in mind that both of these places got updated. Yeah, of course, but it's the two-way binding, so we can just change it to random. And as you saw, I'm typing and it's happening. What is happening is uh, whatever you're typing is directly affecting the value of name. This expression name goes back to it and modifies it. And as a result, this also gets gets affected. Okay. So now we have been told, oh, mutable state, bad. Two-way binding, bad. No, they're bad because we, uh, we create race conditions um, by not writing our code uh, by the API, the, the API, the platform is failing us. That's why they're bad. The platform is not um, making sure race conditions don't happen, right? So um, again, immutable state would be helpful if we were all doing functional programming only, but we are not. We are using general JavaScript and only when it comes to st state, we, we think functional programming is good. What about the rest of it? No. So the, we, have been, uh, we have been conditioned to, to enjoy our shackles. And that's simply, yeah, that's not necessary. You know, break off those shackles and you'll realize that, you know, the freedom is, feels good. Okay. All right. So that was, uh, you know, um, two way binding. I mean, you can do a lot with this, this think of input, input could have been a swelled component also. So a swelled components property Component is updating your a property and, and this parent is getting it and parent is updating a property and, and component is, is getting it. That's what, so think of it, you know, broader than that. So how, how do you inject like validation in the cycle? Okay, good, good point. So there are many ways to do that. One is to simply uh, um, not allow direct modification like this. Of course that you lose a lot of power. Another is you can, inject reactive statements like this. This is a reactive statement. And here you, I can, this statement, whenever you use um, a variable inside it, let's say, I say if name dot length greater than 10 characters or five characters, let's say, uh, okay. Let's say 15 characters. Then change name to um, too long or something like that. I'm just making, so this could be an, an, uh, a validation. You see that? That should help. So obviously this was a contrived example. And okay, so hello is, is blank. You don't want to show blank. You can say, okay, fine. Either name, otherwise show stranger, not stronger. Right, so every time you, Okay, so this 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 is standard. You've seen this, but this is this is interesting, isn't it? So this runs if you don't put the re reactive prefix in front of it. This will run only on the on the first render, or not on the first render, but th this this may not work uh, the way you expect. See, it's not working. Why? Because this statement was was not marked as reactive, and you do this, and now it. Every time, it, it, it is detecting that you're, you're using name inside uh, this reactive block. So every time name changes, it runs this. So the compile time, it, it, it parses out the body of the function, finds yeah. the variable. Absolutely, yes. Correct. Very good question. So let me let me just do that. So let me very quickly create a guest book. Okay. So let's this will uh, this will answer your question. If there was an array, what would what would be the case, what would happen? So I am going to let you input something, and then you say, let's uh, have uh, an unsigned list or uh, ordered or unordered list. Here's another new um, directive called each each. And then you give it an, a collection names as name. Um, let's call it n, just to not confuse it with name otherwise, right? 
and here you say li uh, so this is uh, sorry n so the people who have signed the guest book okay all right so now you can just say let names be an empty array right so obviously if guest book is empty you could you could put an else if you say so there is this colon syntax else which means if there are no names guest book is empty so this is the beginning now if you wanted to um, s modify the array names right so you could say function sign guest book and then you say names dot uh, push which this is what you would otherwise do uh, push name into it this won't work though so if I go to the button on change which means when you tab out of it or press enter right on change uh, do this sign guest book keep in mind you are giving it a value a reference to the function right so if I now on change if I try to change I'm pressing enter and, and it's not signing the guest book it is actually calling this function but name names is being modified uh, in place without uh, so so the swell compiler doesn't like that instead what you should do is you should say names you reassign basically so instead of now of course in this case don't say push say concat because concat returns a value right now it will start working yes correct because otherwise uh, otherwise a sweat would have to know that dot push is modifies name and it would th there's no way it can it can of course build, uh, know the existing javascript api but you will create new apis where some methods are mutating it and there's no way for it to know so that's why you you basically indicate to the compiler that this is i am mutating it and that works all right does that answer the question yeah all right so question yeah can you use um es6 features like the rest spread syntax in spell okay yeah repeating the question can you use es6 yes you can um you can yeah one way you might want to do something like modify arrays you can add uh, you can turn it into a reactive statement by labeling with that dollar dollar colon there mm -hmm. um, and then you can do something like names dot or names dot filter or something like that so you can have reactive statements that do sort of uh, functional mapping of data yeah so inside this you can use all es6 and then um, you know reactive when, when necessary you can also import es uh, i mean you can write separate dot js files and import them here and uh, all those good things we will we'll look at that um, when we get to more complicated examples that tyler uh, ty and, and and james will will show and of course in the end i might show a few things so okay what would be the prescribed way of doing it you know completely re recreating your whatever state or doing the reactive i think reactive is fine i think i think both is the answer uh, with something like this you probably want to do this sort of thing but if you're doing something that's more derived, like a, if you had a second list of things, uh, and this might be something that, that more uh, you would hoist into like a global state, and I'll talk a little bit about stores, um, but yeah. Because I would assume like while we push in uh, like name, you know, new name into names, um, I would hope it will just modify the new item, but if you rewrite in the whole name, no no let's see okay concat since, since, since it doesn't track changes in virtual dom it doesn't know exactly what your current state is in a browser so it will like whenever you do this name equals name to concat mm. you push in a completely new reference into the variable it will create a new mm. You could you could have done names uh, you could simply say name equal to name that's it you just say name dot push something and then say names equal to names. That will work too. But that's, that's, that way it, uh, um, no, I don't, I don't know. Well, with arrays probably, because they're by value, right? 
What? With arrays, probably for work, they would get a sign yeah. of value. But with, uh, let's say, with objects, so you have to have a new object reference. No, no, you don't. Let me show you. Yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, you don't, you don't. So if, if name in, uh, was inside an object, so let's say name, let obj, right, equal to, so yeah, let me do the object reference example, right. And now, if you had input find value equal to obj dot name right so it's not obviously not working right so let's make it a reactive assignment uh, you, you, when you do hello name it doesn't you need obj that means hello h1 what in h1 there you reference a name which is not five five oh sorry that's right right Okay, so that works. In place, modification. It knows, I and mean, if you were assigning it, uh, if you reassign to OBJ, that will also work. So the reference in this case is going directly not to OBJ, but to its property. It goes deeper. This is. I mean, I, I, would, I would think this is because defining is explicit, or that, that way it was probably mm. already wrapped into your reactive stuff. Okay, well, let me see. Hmm. If you have it, let's say you put a JavaScript there that on the timeout changes. Oh, yeah, sure. Not a problem. It will work exactly as before. Yeah, it, 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 it's surprising how unsurprising the behavior is. Like how, how few pitfalls really there are. There, I mean, it is quite good. All right, so let's, uh, uh, I, there are a few, one example that I do want to show you before I, before we have, we get other guys in here is props and slots. This is very helpful. So I have an app.swelt. Uh, so properties, uh, which is in, so this is how I import another um, component into this component. And then it, this is how I instantiate the other component inside app component, right? And then you can say, I just tapped out of that. It's doing async. So if you look at the geocoder, let's not go, uh, I, 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 the things that I want to show you is that place is a prop of geocoder. So that's why when you inst you're instantiating, you're saying you're passing in place equal to name, whatever I have, whatever is name here becomes place inside that. So this is how you're calling another um, component. And this is how you will, you will pass a prop to that component. And that prop. So this is another piece of syntax export let something that is another uh, that they have it's valid javascript but it has a special meaning here and that is you i'm 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 defining properties that could be two way bound also by the way but by default they are one way bound if i say export const place then it is one way bound um, like that so um at, anyway i don't think export const makes much sense um so the one thing i wanted to show you was slots Whatever is the child content of a component is what they call a slot. And this is the default slot. You never, if you don't name it, then it's default slot. If you, if this was a name slot, you would say slot equal to some name, right? This, that is a name, a name slot. And, and then this thing doesn't quite work. Yeah, see, nothing showed up here. If, even if I say London, because I, I, the default slot doesn't exist. But this is the uh, non-default slot. Oh, sorry, this is the default slot. Um, I say London. The thing you will, uh, that is worth noting that this is an ordered list. 
if you didn't have this slot, uh, this is my override of the slot. So now the system is doesn't have a child content, which means the default slot is not supplied by the consumer. And now it still works because there is an implementation of that default slot here. This is the default implementation of the default slot. And now it's unordered list because it's unordered by according to this guy. You want to override that behavior? You just do this. Oops, what did I do? Let me just go back to the and reset this. Yeah. So this is the or you, you overrode that slot implement. So this is not just that. The beautiful thing is you can have multiple slots. Um, for, only one can be default. The others are named slots. This is equivalent to uh, this dot children property of of um, React. Except this dot children you can have only one in React, right? This one allows you any number. Not only that. The variables are, are now available. See that this is the uh, the the these are uh, this place x variable places x. I on purpose I called it places x, and the name local variable name is x, and you can iterate over that. While in the actual component, uh, it's called places, and it's being exported through the slot to the parent as place his x. Uh, so the component itself uses places, but it says if the parent wants to use it, they can bind to places x. And then here is places x, which is being assigned to, exported as a places x, assigned to x, now you iterate over x. So this, this is far, far more powerful. Multiple slots, number one. Number two, two-way communication between the, the slot and the, and the parent, or the consu consumer. They can use each other's variables. Yes, it does, and I've used them. Yes, it does. So, first component, uh, will, uh, the the parent the, uh, is using a component, say comp one, which has slots, and parent provides it, and then comp one uses more slots to, uh, on its child, and uh, yeah, you can have that. So, Leonard, do you have to know the internal variables? No, you uh, you're right. Uh, you do have to know what slots. Uh, yes, you do have to know. There isn't a an API only. You do have to look the, look at the source code and see what what slots exist. Yeah. Okay. But uh, hopefully, if you are using a third, first of all, you are probably not going to use non. So this is JavaScript. You have, they have to supply the source code generally. But even if it was pre-compiled and all, then they would have to supply it, you some documentation. Okay. And then once TypeScript support comes, I, I hope everything will just, you press dot and you see all the completions, etc. So the IDE will, will tell you. So TypeScript support currently doesn't exist in Svelte out of the box. All right, so I think I should stop here. Uh, con there are a lot of things, context and stores. Um, stores, I'll just talk about them. I won't demo them because stores are basically the answer to shared state. All your global store uh, doesn't have to be a single global store. You can have as many stores as you want and then you just, these are um, pop sub stores. If you make any modification to the, to the store, it automatically is seen by everyone who is subscribed to it. And you don't even have to call dot sub, sub, subscribe. We will see that in other examples. So mm, I will yield the floor to Ty. Okay, Ty is going to show you some cool examples. And then James will, okay. All right. All right, so uh, for, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Ty, um, I'm a software engineer. I work for a company remotely that, uh, that is based in Virginia. Um, I do all sorts of stuff. I do not use Svelte on the job professionally, but it is my, my current UI framework of choice. Um, see, I've got a couple of slides somewhere. Okay, so my goal here is just to talk a little bit about why I like Svelte. 
personally, like why it's my personal choice these days, um, as well as maybe show you a couple of uh, simple things. I think I'm probably only going to do one component uh, based on the time, but um, it's something that I find myself having to either implement or consume via a library in everything that I've ever done, at least, uh, you know, especially business applications. Um, so uh, one of the points that Rich Harris makes is, is he asks the question, what is the language of the web? Does anybody want to wanna try it? Try HTML. HTML, right? Um, and you, you might be tempted to say JavaScript, um, but the case is that the, the language of the web is HTML. It's how everything communicates. Um, even AJAX requests, right? It's just a very a different way to consume um, hypertext, right? Uh, back in the day, it was XML, right? For a, a long time, then it was XHTML. Now it's HTML, just normal HTML with uh, body responses. Um, and so, one of the, one of the points I really want to make is that um, you can do everything that you can do with Svelte with React, right? And you can do everything that you can do with React with Angular and, and Vue. It's just how you go about it. Um, you have to make choices when you're creating software, and it's really up to you as an individual. And those, your priorities can change not just as an, as an individual, but based on the project, right? If you're trying to learn how to do low-level graphics implementations and, and do all sorts of uh, crazy stuff, you might develop a game engine. But if your goal is to produce a game, you're going to probably use a game engine that already exists, right? Um, and, and I think when people are doing web development, typically they're not trying to... Uh, Reimplement or you know reinvent the wheel, so to speak, right? They're trying to get something done, um, and that's that is one of the big points for Svelte for me. Um, there's a little bit of a of a dissonance for me, and of course, this is like my own personal um, approach to things. But but for me, I also am really interested in functional programming. So I really like things like Clojure and Elm and Haskell. Um, and there's a little bit of a disconnect there. How do you get something this expressive um, in something like Haskell or Clojure? Um, and the answer is currently you don't. <laughs> um, but And I've got a couple of things, a couple of small examples I'll show. Um, but my point is that when I'm developing applications that are going to be sent out across the web, I want to do it in the language of the web, right? I want to write HTML. Um, that's for a couple of reasons. One, that's what the browser's using, right? And two, it makes sense to me. I've been using HTML for like eight years now, nine years, whatever. And I'm very familiar with it, right? It doesn't surprise me much anymore. Um, so you have to decide when, when you're creating an application what layers of indirection you want to add, right? If I wanted to use React, I have to choose to use JSX, right? And JSX is not HTML, it is a different language, right? So now you have to keep two specs in your brain at any one point in time, right? The HTML that you want to produce for the browser to view or to, to consume, right, in some way, and the JSX that you're going to be writing in order to um, to produce that HTML. It's, uh, the way that I look at it is if I was going to write a, a, an essay or a paper, and my goal is to produce a paper in English, right? I'm not going to write it in French and then translate it to English afterwards, right? It wouldn't make much sense. Uh, if my, and vice versa, if my goal is to produce a paper in French, I would probably write it in French rather than writing it in English and then translating it. Um, now, now the, there's all sorts of uh, layers of indirection in software engineering tooling, right? The compiler itself, if you've ever written C code or Java code, all of that is like, you, none of that is what the computer sees, right? I mean, it's going to get either by code on the Java VM or something, or uh, binary on a system, some system programming language. Um, so pretty much nothing that we actually do is raw, right? And so there's going to be some layers of indirection in everything that you do. And it's just, it's up to you to decide which things, you know, you're okay with and which things you're not. For me, I love React, right? I, there's no argument to be made that React hasn't changed the web ecosystem fundamentally. Um, it is a fantastic addition to the timeline of web development, and I love it. And I've used it quite a lot. Uh, I'm very familiar with it. I'm very familiar with the API. All 18 versions that we've been through, right? Now we're using hooks. And <laughs> I remember there was a point in time where I wasn't using hooks, and I went on Stack Overflow or something, and people were like, oh, you're not using hooks? What a nerd. And... Uh, you know, you have to kind of relearn the API every couple of months, which it, that's just uh, the nature of the web, right? Um, so in my case, React sort of lost me very early on at uh, class name, right? It's not, it's not HTML, right? You, you have to learn this other spec. And it's not that complex, right? I've done a lot of React work, um, and you, you can definitely get through it. But it's one of those choices that you get to make, right? And Svelte shows us a different way. Um, 
there's still a level of indirection there though, right? I mean, he showed you some of the HTML stuff. You've got this hash each uh, directive or whatever they want to call it. It looks like templates. Um, but that stuff really just adds very simple functionality on top of HTML, right? And the goal is to generate HTML, but you're, and, and you're looking at HTML. And for me, it's just the simplicity just makes more sense. And that's not to say that it's for everybody, right? Um, but for me personally, when I look at the differences between something like JSX and something like HTML with a couple of template um, tooling around it, it, it just feels right. right? There's, there's nothing I could say that's, um, that's going to sell anybody that's not interested, but uh, when I write spell components, it just feels like I'm writing HTML, right? I write HTML, I write CSS, I write a little bit of JavaScript. Um, one of the questions that I feel is very typical is, well, what about TypeScript? And for me personally, I'm actually really not a fan of TypeScript at all. I really actually kind of hate TypeScript. Uh, for me, TypeScript is an attempt to, uh, to, to take this, the mindset of you know, doing something in something like Java or C Sharp and, and bring it to, to the web. I actually personally don't uh, really use JavaScript a ton anymore. I actually use Elm for the most part. Um, and, and that's one of the things I'll go over here is kind of the dissonance between trying to do something like a functional reactive style and then trying to also get the clarity of the, the language that the web is using. It's really not something that exists right now. Um, I would just add one thing to that. Uh, the reason why you need TypeScript in something like React is because this API is so huge. There's so much, and of course other uh, products that you use, you will be using uh, their, uh, their API. But if you are, if, in Swift Component 2, what happened here? Okay. okay, yeah. So I was saying that uh, it would, uh, um, you need a TypeScript because the API is so huge. But you, if you are coding in a, in a outside of a Swell component, a Swell component should not have too much code, right? So uh, if you have a lot of code, do it in a .js file. And where you can do TypeScript, you can do whatever you like. Right. Yeah. And, and so, uh, you know, for me personally, like I was saying, I, I don't really think about the JavaScript way of writing software anymore. Um, I still do it on a day-to-day -day basis, actually. Uh, my, my job, my full-time job, uh, I actually support a really bad AngularJS app. It's legacy, it's awful. But So I'm like, I'm very familiar with the internals and the specifics of AngularJS. Not Angular, right? AngularJS. Um, and kind of one of, one of the issues with AngularJS is the scoping stuff. I won't get too much into that, but... Um, but Svelte really solves those problems, and it does it kind of in a reactive way, right? It steals the ideas from React, but it does it in a way that gives you the ability to do it in a very expressive way, right? You're not using some API, you're just writing code. And there's a couple of small nuances that you have to learn, but it just feels so good. Um, okay, so uh, even if, you, if you've ever done functional programming, uh, they really take this sort of like data-driven uh, approach to things, right? And so... Um, I've I've tried kind of everything out there, um, and I, I love Elm um, personally, and I, I like ClojureScript. I like ClojureScript. I love Elm, uh, but but even data feels wrong. Here's an example of, of some ClojureScript code, and you can see you see the mouse. Yeah, all right. So you can see down here, you're sort of like generating these HTML tags as data, right? This is certainly not the language of the web, right? This is definitely not HTML, and you could get around it by saying, like, you know, it, it's it's functional, right? It's a pure function. It goes from this description of your state, right, to uh, to some HTML, and that's cool, and I like that. Uh, I like that it's that it's a pure function, right? But I don't like that. Does anybody like that, right? As opposed to HTML, I I hate that. I love ClojureScript. I hate that. Um, and Elm is just as bad, right? Here's a div with some styling. This makes me want to kill myself, right? This is awful. This is the worst thing I've seen all day. Um, so, I it's hard to it's hard to say like how I would actually write software these days because I would want to use something like Elm, but I would not want to do this right. And so there, we're we're kind of stuck in this weird spot where you have to choose one. And so uh, you know, given the extremely awesome ecosystem that JavaScript has, I think JavaScript is obviously the choice, right? Um, and and for me, the expressive power of Svelte is just the way to do it. So again, that's, that's less uh, really an argument for Svelte for, for you and more of an argument for Svelte for myself. But um, what I have here is I have this really simple uh, Svelte parcel template. Parcel, for those of you that don't know, is a bundler, very similar to Webpack or uh, Rollup, but just better. Um, in my opinion, it's like it, out of the box. It kind of just knows how to do things. Um, it's really great. Hey, Ty, uh, this is using parcel. Uh, is that uh, 
the the canonical way of doing, uh, or should we show them they take it basic first step? Because they then this will be their first program. So can we do hello world and make it first before we go in here? Because otherwise they think that this is the only way to do it. Uh yeah sure um so. Uh, is, I, I'm assuming people are familiar with MPX at this point, maybe, maybe not. MPX is a way to run a dependencies that are either installed globally on your machine or installed locally at the package level um, and just run them once. You can also, use, I think there's a way to do it like where you can use things without actually installing them even um, if they're not installed, yeah. something like that. So if, I was assuming that yours will be using that approach to get started. So is it okay if uh, I yeah. quickly show them the dig it? Very simple hello world, yeah, so that yeah, they sure. know. Uh, then, then you can launch into. So I wanted to basically just very quickly show the 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 way you should do write your first program. Okay, I'm going to okay, I'm going to open a new um, VS Code. Okay, so this is not messing with yours. Okay, all right. So uh, you can uh, go to your terminal, right, or you can just open a terminal here in VS Code. Okay whichever you prefer and then uh, go to the directory I'm going to say devsworld um, and I'm wherever you're going to create the project run npx which is a program that comes with with npm right? npx de git d git right clone and git repository but get rid of the dot git file uh, folder and all that right and you do swelt js slash template this is right yeah, so this is the template. So you are going to GitHub, it goes to github.com slash swelljs slash template and clones it and removes the dot git repo and we'll call it swell hello, let's say. Is that, okay, yeah, good. I think you might need hash roll up or hash roll after the. Yeah, so there are two branches, but I think the default is a roll up, so we don't have to say that anymore. Oh, okay. So there are two branches. One is if you want to use roll up or webpack. Okay, but um, default is rollup and rollup. If you haven't, I I got familiar with with rollup only after I started using Svelte. So rollup is actually very beautiful, very much easier. To, and I do know Webpack. Webpack is, I mean, I've seen, looked inside, and you know, it's not uh, rollup. I like very much. Um, other than that, anyway. So let's we just pre do that. npx dig it Svelte js slash template, and then the name of your directory that it will create. And it just did. It created that. And you open that uh, in your uh, open for uh, dot dot dot, and it'll open a folder. So I, I go to Svelte slash Svelte hello. This one. Double click. It opened this. At this point, uh, you have. Um, sorry, I'm stealing some of your time, but I, I think basics are in order. So there is a package.json, right? As you can see, there are only dev dependencies and in runtime dependency, there is this HTTP server, which is not even really a runtime dependency, but I don't know why. So uh, that's because Svelte is a compiler. Uh, at runtime, you don't need Svelte. You need it at compile time. So that's why there is no uh, runtime dependencies. Now, it, uh, we have to download these dependencies. There are multiple ways of doing that. I am going to simply go to the, the shell and say npm install. Right? You can do a yarn install if you like, right? So that got, gets you everything. Don't worry about those errors. Those are not something to do with my laptop. They are not anything serious. Now, uh, that created node uh, modules, whole bunch of mo node modules, and so on and so forth. And it also created package dot lock uh, dash lock, which is fine. Now let's run our code. To run, we say npm run dev. If you wanted to do dev mode and uh, when you do that oops what happened here oh because because something is running Wait, is your project running or maybe my project is running let me let me kill this project yeah so let's uh, run it again right and it says go to localhost 5000 I clicked on it. Of course, my, mine is in running in full screen mode. So what I have to do is, I have to stop run in full screen mode. And now, if I control click on this again, okay, hello world. So let me now put these two side by side. 
And which one is my this one? So this is okay. So now um, hello world is running. If you the, let me just explain the st uh, structure of the project. As you know, package.json is most important. It has the script for running dev mode, which is rollup minus c. Uh, I won't go into the details of this. Um, and then rollup.config.js is very important. Again, I won't go into details of it. That would take too much time. But it, it came with the project. The thing that as a developer you need to worry about is main.js, which mounts the app comp it instantiates the app component and tells it to mount itself in document.body. And that doesn't replace the body, it simply adds children to the body. Okay, keep that in mind. And it is passing props to the app component. And app component itself takes one prop called name and it prints it, right? If I and if I delete this and save it, you see. You should see why, why is it not? Oh, I didn't delete it. Sorry. Oh, yeah, I didn't delete it. Okay, I okay. Yeah, as soon as I saved it, it it disappeared from here. I bring it back. It shows up. So this is live live reloading and all. Uh, so as a developer, you need to know that there is a main.js. It is the entry point of your bundle. And there's one more thing, which is your HTML file, index.html. So let me just show you what's going on here. Uh, index.html, the only thing Swell specific is this line. Oh, sorry, these two lines, I, I meant these two lines. So Swell will compile your in, inline uh, styles, you know, component, the style that is inside the component into bundle.css. And it will uh, all this JavaScript gets compiled into bundle.js, and the bundles are pretty small. Um, you can see it's about three kilobytes for this hello world, very basic. All right, that is uh, so. Just to recap, you need to know uh, uh, index.html is including your CSS and JS that is generated by Svelte. The uh, entry point is main.js, which mounts the app component. So from an app standpoint, entry point is app. And now you can import other components inside this and include them and that's your okay that's all i wanted to show Th this is how you would start most of your uh, swell projects at least in the beginning all right so back to uh, you i don't know where is this the one yeah no. okay I should be able to just do something like. Uh, no, no, no. Your, your VS Code is still running. So. Oh, gotcha. Your code is run. Uh, is this not it? No. Uh, keep. Uh, I didn't close your VS you Code. Did you open yours? I, I did not. No. Oh, okay, then, then, yeah. Go I got it. Man. I thought you had. Because I saw parcel answer. You let me before you get into parcel. Okay, so the nice thing about parcels is that you get all of that uh, without doing anything. Um, you don't have a crazy config file. So I've got uh, I've got parcel, I've got the Svelte plugin, I've got the SAS plugin, right, and that's it. Um, uh, my my source actually looks very similar, right? I've got this HTML file. The difference is that it doesn't import something bundled; it just imports an CSS file, right? And, and this just imports the the index.js which in turn imports a Svelte component, so it kind of drills down and knows how to uh, bundle your stuff up kind of dynamically depending on, on what you're doing. Uh, one sec, I need to disable Vim mode. Oh, or disable, yeah, go ahead. There we go. Cool. All right, so uh, you know, basically what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna create a simple data table component. Uh, this is probably something that you've seen everywhere, uh, but basically what I want to do is I want to be able to pass in a, a list of columns with some accessors, um, and I want to be able to pass in a list of data and then display that and do something like uh, maybe sorting or, or, or searching, right? Um, I'm going to probably do a small subset of that stuff um, since we don't have a ton of time, but uh, what I will do, I'm going to start by creating a folder and call it components. And then I'm going to create something. I'm going to create two things beneath that. One is going to be called nav.svelte. This is mostly just so I can show off like how nice it is to just be able to write uh, CSS um, inside of your component. Um, and 
and how it feels to sort of create a simple component that doesn't really do anything and then pull in um, some uh, a component into into the application. And then as well, I'm going to go ahead and create data table dot svelte, right? Um, oh, also, if you do use this template, uh, this is out on GitHub, so you can get this uh, really easily. You can actually clone my template using dgit as well if you're interested. Um, I also include the settings.json, so it automatically does file associations for svelte if you're going to use VS Code. I think that's kind of nifty. Um, okay, so let's do some stuff. So I'm going to create a nav. Better instead of doing File association HTML just have plugins for VS Code that can handle Svelte file because those plugins do exist. Yeah. If that's yeah. how you want to do it, sure. I have it after you. So, yeah, uh, and they give you specific help. So, yes. I, I've not really found a need for anything extra. I just kind of, it's just HTML. That's kind of why I like it, right? I just, I'm just writing HTML, so I don't really have to think about it. But um, if you find yourself needing something like that, I'm sure there's something out there. Um, so we'll do something like this, right? Um, we'll do login, something, just something simple, right? Oh, also, I should probably go ahead and. Sorry, I'm also not super familiar with this setup, but. Okay, I can do that. I'm good, man. Cool. So that's running. You want the browser side? What's that? You want to browse the next to the site? Uh, no, no, I'm good. Okay, cool. So I've got my nav. I'm going to go into my app and I'm going to import uh, nav from nav.svelte. Sorry, just forgive me as well. I don't do uh, like an absolute ton of, um, of live coding for people. So if I make mistakes, just try and bear with me. I'm also using like this disjointed thing, but you know. so personally, I like to put my style tags last, um, and I like to keep it. I, I like to keep it in this order: script, HTML, style. It's whatever, really. I mean, whatever feels comfortable to you. Um, so we'll do something like let's actually make sure that this is outputting. Uh, let's go ahead and. I think this is because of my style tag, potentially, we'll see. Um, so I'm just gonna give this a background color of, you know, whatever, say, somebody throw out a color. Blue. Oh, sounds good, man. Jitesh has got his, his scroll all backwards, man. I don't know what he's doing. Let's see. Oh, I didn't give it a relative path almost for sure, right? So it's looking for a library called nav.svelte. Cool. Okay, so we got that. Um, Any folder should be text color should be white. What's that? Background is, because background is blue, maybe text color should be white. Oh, yeah. I'm, that's that's about it. Sure, we'll give it a color. Right. Actually, show off this, right? So I can target LIs in this component uh, without having to nest it or anything crazy. I'm just targeting all LIs, so I'm just going to do color white. I'm going to do something like font size. Uh, I'm going to do what, 20, 20 pixels, right? whatever. Cool. And then I think we can do, what is it? Uh, list, list style type, right? None, something like that. Anybody know off the top of their head? Okay, cool. There we go. All right, so one last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give this a display flex. Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, this needs to go. Here. Boom. Okay, All right. And then I could do something like um, li colon nth child. Two. We do. Uh, actually, we'll do margin left. We may have to do a little bit uh, extra to get this sort of lining up. Oh, hey, look, no, we're good. All right, flexbox is awesome. Um, and then we'll do margin right 
I know a lot of this doesn't really matter, so I probably won't spend too much time trying to make this thing look good, right? But you get the point. So now I've got a simple component, and I can do stuff with it, but I'm not going to do anything with it. Actually, I, I think I might do something simple. Um, so under source, I'm going to add a file called stores.js, and I'm just going to show off just quickly what stores look like. Um, so I'm going to import writable from at svelte slash stores. Yeah, sure. All right, and then I'm going to export a const called user that is a writable store initialized with undefined. Okay, so now I have, so the way that, uh, that Svelte uh, tackles uh, state management is it gives you these things called stores. You've got writable stores and readable stores, uh, and they're observables, right? Um, and so for anybody that's not super familiar with observables, basically what they are, they're, they're a pattern, they're a, a, a paradigm, if you will, of objects that implement a subscribe function of some type. And you can subscribe to changes to them. So whenever, it, whenever you create a variable like this, you'll say, you know, uh, const user equals new observable, observable.subscribe, here's a, a lambda function or something that I want you to run whenever that thing changes. And when it changes, it will loop through uh, anything that's subscribed to it and it'll run those functions. Um, and that's how you're supposed to do things with Svelte. The nice thing is that Svelte actually gives you a really nice syntax for auto-subscribing to changes. So um, in my nav.svelte, if I wanted to disable these, right, um, sorry, hash each, right, or I'm sorry, brain, right, so if user, Right. Um, normally, you would do something like you would come up here, you would import that observable, you would subscribe to it, and on subscribe, you'd create a function. That function would run every time it changes, um, and that's that's nice. I mean, that's that's cool and all, but we don't want to do that, right? Because it's boilerplate and it's not super necessary. Um, so I'm going to import my user, right, from stores. That should work. No. It might be store, not stores. Huh. Let's go to the, the uh, tutorial. Oh, okay, no ad, my bad. Interesting. The point is, um, if I don't want to uh, subscribe to changes and then do something to modify my local state whenever something changes, I can just add a dollar sign, right? And so this will automatically subscribe to changes for me. Um, if we can get it to show up, let's inspect. Writable is not a function. I think you're lying to me. Let's just steal this line. Oh, there we go. Of course. I, I misspelled writable. That's my bad. Okay, so it starts off undefined, and so you'll see that the nav does show those two, or does not show those two links. Ooh, that's interesting. I don't think there were. Sorry. Oh, weird. Okay, I'm not too worried about this, but you get the idea. Um, if you have your stores working correctly and it, you know, you're know you not crushed for time, um, instead of having to subscribe and to do something whenever that thing changes, you could just put a dollar sign and it'll, it'll subscribe for you. That's really nice. Uh, so technically speaking, if I had this working correctly, I'm not gonna spend time figuring out what's wrong, but um, I could do something like, I got a, log, a login service here that uh, does something like you know get user via information, right? Or in, in a, uh, a login form somewhere that has a function, right? Whenever I submit this form, I'm gonna run this login, it logs in, it does something asynchronously, it updates the store, boom, now my nav knows that there's a user, right? So that's cool. 
Okay, so we're just gonna move on to the data table, just show you guys some stuff. So I'm gonna create two, uh, two props for this guy, right? Uh, one is gonna be the columns and one's gonna be the data. Whoops. All right. Then I'm going to create a table, right? And I'm gonna have a head to that table. It's gonna have a row. Oops, sorry. And then for each column that's passed in, I'm going to create a th that it just outputs, uh, oh, sorry. Like I said, bear with me, I'm also not super frequently coding for people in a live audience. Um, so I'm gonna output column.title, right? Pretty simple. Then I'm gonna create a t-body. And I'm going to do another each. Right. For each piece of data that's passed in. Oh yeah, thanks. So for each piece of data that's passed in, let's say as D, right? Um, oh, sorry. I am going to loop through them and create a row. Then I'm going to loop again through the columns. Right. And there's probably some sort of like functional way that you could do this to use like curried functions or something to make this easier on yourself. But for now, I'm just going to use the default um, svelte syntax, right? So instead of outputting a th, I'm going to output a td. And I'm going to output something from data indexed on column.accessor. Of course, so there, and there's all types of... Uh, um, I'm not checking like types or, or, or data that's coming into this, but um, what is accessor? accessor is something I'll define here in a sec. So say columns is an array of objects, right? The first object has a title of, uh, let's say column one, keep it really simple, and an accessor of name. Actually, let's just call this name as well, right? We'll just add a second column. Call this email. So we're going to create a table here that has a bunch of people, right? It has a name and email for each person. And the data is going to look very similar. It's going to be an array of things. Have a couple of people with some emails. And then I will create that component. And I will pass in my props. And you can imagine these props coming from somewhere else, right? They could come from a service, they could come from anywhere. But as long as I have this data, that's all that matters. Table is not defined. I don't think I imported it. And I'll try to wrap up here quickly. But you get the point. And I could spend some time making this look nice, but there you go. You know. And uh, one of the, one of the ways that I, I like to add something like uh, pagination. Or whenever I make this component, like my actual version of this component has sorting, pagination, and searching for each field that's configurable for that particular column. Um, and you can you could also add something like if you wanted to make it fancy, you could add function accessors, not just simple uh, property names, but like a function that you can map the uh, the piece of data to to get that particular row of data. 
Um, so if you want to show you the completed version. Yeah, sure. Do you, uh, it's in there. Do you want to pull that up? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's linked. In the completed version is not really the completed version. It's a, it's a version I made in the, the Svelte Dev Repl. Um, as kind of as a, a simple prototype for, for doing this sort of thing. Mm. Oh gosh, I, I pressed something. The completed version. Where is it? Mm. It's linked in the document. By the way, this document is shared with you. So go to live coding your first Favorite table. Yeah, this one. This is. The, yeah, go ahead and. Hey, and yeah, like I was saying before, the. Um, Anything that you could do with Svelte, you could do with React. That's why I didn't do anything crazy like asynchronous data or anything else because, uh, I mean, these things are these things are things you guys already know about, right? These are problems you've already solved. Um, what, I'm, what I'm showing here, the, the, the interesting thing to me is that I've got some JavaScript, and here I used an on-mount, so this is kind of lifecycle hooks. You guys are all familiar with this from React or even AngularJS. Um, and I did some stuff to sort of initialize the columns, right? I'm mapping the columns into something new. Um, and setting a field, and I've got some const here for sorting stuff, and and some functions to do sort. Right, uh, this is like a really naive implementation, but you get the idea, right? So th there's some stuff there, uh, but the JavaScript is just JavaScript, and it's really simple, and you can keep it clean if you want. You, you can make it messy if you want, right? It's it's whatever is up to you. But the the thing is that the actual stuff, right, the stuff that you're looking at, it's all defined here in HTML, right? There's no there's no tricks. Any of the functions are just functions that I've defined in JavaScript. Uh, there's no new syntax aside from the the couple of template things, right? You want to show the store when I? Uh... I don't think I actually. Okay, so there's this. Um, I I don't think I have it actually implemented here, so I'm not going to run through it. But here's an example uh, of what you could do with a store that's pretty it's pretty awesome. Um, this is a local storage store. So I've created a function that takes a key and a starting value, and it creates a new writable store from Svelte. And it gets these two things, the subscribe and set method. They're exactly what you'd expect. Subscribe is for observable stuff. Set is a setter. Um, and it returns an object that has those two functions defined, but also has this other thing, this use local storage. And you could probably do this a little bit cleaner and better, but the idea is that it initializes from local storage, and then it subscribes to any changes, and it saves those to local storage. Right. So when you initiate your, initialize your store for the first time, it'll try to go to local storage and get it. And if you've got... Um, if you change it, it'll update it in local storage as well. So you could use this for something like a user token or maybe some data that you want to be persistent in the browser for the user, but like not actually go to the database for it or something like that. So that's cool. And then you could just create that just like this. You just wrap your key in a function and then use this. And of course, if you wanted, if I wanted to do this correctly, I'd probably have this called for me, right? And it would just look like using that function. Um, but that's whatever. Uh, the, the thing that I like the most about this is that my table is really just HTML. And I can look at it and I can reason about it the same way that I would about any other HTML that I could see. Um, and you can see that I've got it looking pretty nice and I've got sorted. So like I said, nothing revolutionary here, right? This isn't anything that you've never seen. This is not anything super cool. Uh, it's just the same stuff but implemented with Svelte. It's really clear, it's really simple, and for me it was, it was fun to write it. That's the thing about Svelte that I love is when I write React, it feels like work. When I write AngularJS, it certainly feels like work. But when I write Svelte, it feels like I'm expressing myself. I'm actually just doing the things that make sense to my brain. I don't have to stop and think about what I'm doing. I don't have to go read some documentation. Right? It's, just, it's just HTML. And so I just kind of sit there and get to have some fun and write some code. And that's it. All right, thanks. Uh, one thing I just wanted to mention about uh, stores was that uh, think of the stores if you are, you are React people, so think of a store as the global store the way, but except without except it's much less fuss, much less ceremony. Um, actually, the best way to think of store is not the React store, but uh, you know, as I mentioned, observables, just a collection of data or a single variable. 
that has a subscribe method. And the dot subscribe gets called automatically when you the prefix with a dollar sign. If your store is called foo, wherever you, uh, uh, if you wanted to access it in pure JavaScript, you would have said foo dot subscribe and give it a callback that receives the, the value. But if, to re remove that ceremony also, you could just say dollar sign foo equal and then assign it to something or use it in your te HTML template. That's it. That will unsubscribe, unsubscribe, get the value and everything all in one. And, and you can set that store uh, from anywhere else, elsewhere. So you, there are there are people who have written Fire Store stores, Firebase stores, and you know you modify things on Firebase, and your store is updating, and all you have is a store imported in your component, and the component is reacting to those changes. All right, James. All right, hey guys, um, my name is James, and uh, like Ty, I really don't like JSX. Um, but I, you know, like like most of us, uh, React is kind of the de facto right now. So um, Svelte is is strictly a side project thing for me. But um, today I'll be demoing one of my favorite Svelte apps. Uh, it's called the Await Block. Um, so to demo that, let's see if I can fire this up. Um, t -t 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 -t. Hopefully a port error. Da -da -da. You gotta run install on this. Yeah, you can ignore those errors. Those are related to me upgrading Catalina. Gotcha. All right. So let's just take a quick look at it so far. All right, cool. So I call it Svelte Mapper. Um, it uses the Nominatum API, which is uh, what we use to consume data from OpenStreetMap, which is a free and open source alternative to Google Maps, um, Apple Maps, what have you. So um, let's see, we'll get Chrome DevTools open here so we can see all the little errors. So we're seeing some errors related to the service worker. We can go ahead and ignore those. So the, the idea is um, we use a library called leaflet.js to um, to display the top result if we search for something on a map. And it's not going to work immediately uh, because we have to add some code. So let's head back to our code. A little crowded in here. Let's see. Oh, this is the wrong one. Oh. Yeah, yep. This is my so go to the slide the sideways. Good. All right, here we are. All right, so um, a lot of this you guys are familiar with at this point. Um, it's it's by and large the the default uh, Svelte template. Uh, but I have a couple components. I have a search component and a map component. Uh, let's start with the app.svelte. Um, so again, it's it's kind of what you've already seen. A little extra. I'm importing a Google font. Nothing too crazy. Um, if we go over to the search. This one's a little more involved. Um, so like I said, we're calling the Nominatum API. So uh, we have that API URL here. And then we have, um, we have two objects here, a query and a promise. Um, so it's interesting that we have this, this what's eventually going to be a promise called promise. Uh, the query will represent uh, the user input. So uh, the user input gets fed into our handle click function, and then we assign promise to the promise of the query nominatum function. Uh, so that's what's actually making the get request to the nominatum API. And it has some pretty run of the mill, you know, if you if you work with React or, or just plain JavaScript, you know, a lot of this is kind of familiar. We just say, hey, if we get a 200 response, then let's return um, a JSON representation of the first result. Uh, so this is the first result that we get back from nominatum. Uh, otherwise, we're going to throw a new um, error. So one of the things that I really like about Svelte is, you know, how much, like Ty kind of alluded to or, or kind of said, we're, we're writing something that feels a little more natural. Um, and it doesn't feel quite so much like work. We're expressing ourselves. Um, so we're able to do that with Svelte's await block. And the wait block has three um, components to it. Two of them are required. One of them is optional. And it sort of reads like a try-catch. So we have our await, uh, we have our then, 
and then we have optionally a catch portion of this. So uh, let's start with the await, and we have to tell it what to await, so we're going to await that promise. So Svelte is going to keep an eye on that promise and um, So in this case, we'll want to say, um, let's say searching. So this is a great spot to put like a, a spinner GIF or something like that. This basically represents the, uh, the UI state of, hey, um, I'm waiting on something to come back. So we'll have our await there, and then we have our then, and we can continue to consume the promise. And so uh, this would be uh, the user state when you know, we have uh, actual data coming back. So I would like to use uh, the map component for that. Let's take a quick look at the map component. So the map component uses a JavaScript library called Leaflet. Um, pretty lightweight, one of many options out there. Uh, I won't go through the whole thing, but the, the important thing to note with this, um, for those who are, who are going to check out the repo and maybe clone it and check it out themselves, um, we are, we are passing in one prop, the location, and that's going to contain the coordinates that Leaflet needs to, um, to show us the correct uh, map. Um, but it doesn't provide the map data itself, so we actually have to provide it with a tile provider. Um, so as a lot of you probably know, you know when, you're, when you're zooming in and out on Google Maps or something like that, you, you see a, a lot of squares that maybe fill in slower, more slowly than other squares. So those are called map tiles. Um, and they're, they're essentially images sent over um, the wire from the server to be rendered in the map. Um, so some of them are more complex or larger than others, as you might expect with uh, images with more data in them. So um, might as well use OpenStreetMap for the tile provider as well, since we're using the Nominatum API. Um, so that's what this little bit of code here is for. And um, I think that's pretty much everything of interest in here. So going back to our await block, uh, so let's, let's go ahead and consume that map, and we'll pass in the location. Again, we can use that promise, and I think we'll close it at this point. We'll, we'll come back to that catch. So let's close the await. All right, let's see what we got. Uh, best way to get over to Chrome. Cool. All right, so we see that it sort of works. Um, we see that we have an error that it can't read lat of undefined. So essentially, um, the Svelte code is getting to this point, and we haven't typed anything in yet, so, so promise is undefined. Um, we could set promise to like an empty string to kind of get rid of that error, but you'll see in a minute I have a better way of handling that. Um, so let's just see it happening there real quick. Let's type something in. We type in search, and there we have Jacksonville. Awesome. So it sort of works, uh, but the user experience isn't perfect. So let's make it a little bit better. Um, I'm going to use the if directive to uh, evaluate promise, and if promise is truthy, then we will go ahead and invoke map, and that should take care of that error we just saw. All right, looks good. So we type in Jacksonville again. Perfect. And you'll see that uh, for a split second there, we do see that, that state of uh, awaiting the promise. So we see that searching really quickly. Um, so cool. I think I want to throw in an else, though. I think that there's yet another uh, user uh, interface state that we can throw in here, too make this just a little bit better. Um, no need for promise and else. So this would be a case of us getting no results back. So let's go ahead and type in no results. So now when we type in something like this, we should get no results. We're not getting no results. Uh, I think I'm missing something obvious. If no promise, then no result. Instead, we should have a, the else of then should oh, you are in that. But. Oh, I didn't save it. Ha. There we go. Perfect. Like this worked this morning. All right, cool. When in doubt, command S. 
So now we have, uh, we have some feedback to the user when we don't get any results back instead of just giving them nothing. And they have no idea, you know, hey, is the app broken? Did, did we not get any results back? Um, so cool. Uh, so the final thing that I want to demo here um, is uh, the catch block. So to, to force um, a non-200 response from the nominating API, I'm going to call an endpoint that doesn't exist, xsearch. And let's add a catch. So add that catch in there. And we can still use promise. Cool. Um, and then I believe we get it in the form of promise.message, right? The error object. So let's try searching now. Cool. All right. So we got the error. This is the exact error message that we get from the nominatum API if we were to um, hit that in Postman or something like that. Um, and of course, we can make it a little bit better by giving it a class of error. And that just makes the text red. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, it's, it's cool that we're able to handle all three of those states, you know, waiting for a response. We got a valid response, and then we got an invalid response, all within our markup. Um, the only thing I would say to make this a little bit better, it's a little confusing to call everything promise. So what we can do is kind of name this whatever we want, even though it's all referencing the same promise. Um, we can call this result, and we can say if result, it's a little more intuitive, it reads a little bit better. And the same for this, we can say catch an error and show that as error.message. So now when we search Look at the code. Makes a little more sense. Um, I think I think we're kind of short on time, so I'll. No, no, we have time. So we're going to start lunch right after this. So um, no, if you go ahead and, and, and show up any other first strike feature that you, we want to. Um, we'll do actual coding after lunch. You know, you guys do the real coding. So like, go ahead. Cool, cool. Um, I think the only other thing, so we've got the await, the then, else. I could touch on map a little bit more. I know I kind of glazed over it. Um, it's not Svelte specific, but, um, well, I guess I talked about Leaflet too. The only other thing I would add with Leaflet, um, for anyone who's, who's curious looking at this code, Leaflet um, needs to bind to an element. I just happen to use an ID of map ID. Um, gave it some simple styling. And um, the only thing of note is you have to give it a, a fixed height. Um, so if you don't specify a height, then the containers, it has a width but no height, and then you're not going to see a map. Um, and then if you wanted to, you could swap this out with uh, something from MapQuest API or Google Maps, if you have a, a Google Maps uh, API key. But yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think that's all she wrote. Cool. All right. Great, thank you. Thanks. So before we get to lunch, I just wanted to go over one very important topic that, um, which is why, like making a business case or a technical case for Svelte. And that I think is very um, important. So let me just, uh, where is my, okay here, yeah. So in here, um, in our uh, Google Doc, I have linked to uh, this thing. If you click on why Wait, what is that? Tools. Yeah, the case source world. If you click on this link, it'll open this document. So let's let's take a look at this. I think this is something, you know, because when you guys go to your all developers, you you either have clients or employers, um, whoever makes, uh, you know, you you want to convince them. I think uh, this would help. So I've, I've sp spoken to a lot of people and heard their concerns and try to try to answer those concerns the best I can. So there are two parts to this. One is the technical case, the uh, other is the business case. Technical case obviously is for technical people um, and we will get into, so some, if some of the, the business case sounds buzzwordy, trust me it is, it is backed by technical concrete reasons, okay. So um, maturity. Svelte was released in uh, 2016. Obviously, it was being developed well before that, right? But it was released to the world in 2016. Uh, we are on version 3, which was released in uh, 
um, I think uh, May of 2019, I believe, something like that. But it's been, or April, April, yeah. So it's been out for 10 months at least now. So it has al always been open source and uh, it has incorporated and learned the lessons of Angular, React, Vue, and others, right? Now, at this point in React's lifetime, uh, life cycle, it was already being used outside. So that's pretty good. I mean, at this point, it means. Who supports it? Who supports it? Uh, it's an open source uh, project. So. I mean, when we say supported by, I mean, can you actually send, uh, pick up the phone and call somebody? No. Can you actually make them work on uh, some changes? No. You can uh, um, open a ticket. Yes. Request them something. They Keep in mind that they're such a huge company that they have less incentive to listen to you than a, an open source project. So, uh, it, I don't exactly understand by what is the difference in support. Uh, 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 Right. The other thing is uh, uh, support. Like when you say support, you, uh, I, I don't think you mean somebody answering your phone call. No, no, like yeah. fixing bugs, security bugs, like right. production bugs, and you know, like, yeah, That's you true. I mean, bunch yeah. of people that owe you nothing, or you still have a Dude. company that's using it, and you are just like, well, they'll do it for themselves. Open SSL isn't supported by anyone except for a small group of people, and everyone uses it. I totally see what you're saying, and I think that you're. I think you're right. I think that is a reason to choose React over over Spell or something else. But also, there are there are other things that come <coughs> up. Like, uh, because React is supported by Facebook, they're actually kind of slow moving, not like in surprising ways too, because they they kind of came onto the marketplace and uh, I say. Marketplace, but like they came into the development space and their argument was like AngularJS is cool and other things like it are cool, but they're doing things a little bit wrong and we have we have some better ideas. Um, but then something like Spell comes along and says, like, we have better ideas. Like you can actually do the things you're doing with React, but like you can use it do it with HTML, right? You don't use JSX. And and Facebook's response to that, like pretty much across the board, has been like, Yeah, but we've already done so much with JSX, right? Yeah. Like their arguments are a little bit shrouded in, in some in some different things, but I mean, uh, you also have uh, things like that where it's like obvious, obviously better solutions can come along and they might not adopt those because of certain things like it might be difficult or, or lengthy for them to implement it or they might just not agree. So there are pros and cons, but I agree with what you're saying. Okay, so um, yeah, I mean, uh, the uh, let me just go through these. Uh, so maturity, like I said, it, it, I think it's very mature, very small surface area. Now, ecosystem. Um, are there tons and tons of libraries around, uh, bu built around Svelte? Um, it's there enough, I think, uh, plenty, but not as many as React. But you also have to understand React is older, and more importantly, it needs those libraries more than, than uh, Svelte does. Svelte, for a, small work, for a framework that is smaller than React, it actually includes more than React does, like in the sense that stores are built in and, and slots and uh, slot props um, going in both directions gives you far more than you would be able to get out of React. So so overall it needs less, but it is, it's a fact that ecosystem is smaller. Uh, robustness, I think it, it is more robust because, you know, this is a compiler, not a runtime. Um, compilers are more predictable. Anybody who has used a, a compiler and a runtime knows Runtimes are less predictable, compilers are more predictable. And uh, so, so it's very robust. And then less code also means fewer bugs. Um, fewer. Uh, um, time to market. Again, I have developed in React and I have developed in, uh, in uh, React or Angular and, and in Svelte. The productivity is completely off the charts. It's very different because you are simply writing your HTML with some templating. The thing you have to understand is that it's 
Think of the simplest way to describe would be think of Svelte as a templating language. Okay, that but that's not the end of it. Except that the template is reactive template. So first time it renders whatever the state of your variables was, you reassign those variables and the uh, template is re-rendering re re itself only in the places where it needs to. So, so yeah, so th that increases your uh, productivity and that, that has a direct uh, result on time to market. Again, because there is less code you're writing, you're introducing less bugs, your testing cycles are faster. Now, this is a big one that a lot of people, um, enterprises, they, they are concerned about talent availability. Like where will I get Svelte developers? Um, can I, if I put an ad out for, for job posting for Svelte developers, will I find them? The answer is you already have them. Do your developers know JavaScript? If not, fire them. Uh, but of course they do know. If they're doing React, they know JavaScript. They, do they know HTML? Yes, they do. I mean, anybody, so if they have done any UI development, any whatsoever, they, to learn Svelte will take a day or two. And like I was saying that the tutorial I went through in three hours and I, the, of everything that I know about Svelte, first 70, 80% came from those two or three hours. Of course, since then I learned some nuances here and there. So those, I think uh, that's the business case. I believe, uh, especially it's for uh, independent consultant who are doing projects for their clients on fixed budget, it's a no brainer. Um, one of the concerns that another enterprise concern is, oh, is it ready for the enterprise? Will it scale to um, teams of 50 or 100 or something? First of all, enterprise is small potatoes. We are talking about web scale here, okay? So anybody who thinks enterprise is a big deal, hasn't been paying attention to you know sites like Facebook or Google or so on and so forth. So, so enterprise means what? Uh, 50 user, 500 user, maybe 5,000 users. How about you know billions of users that Facebook has, right? So, and of course they will say, oh, that's why Facebook uses React. Well, they invented React, yes, before Svelte was invented. I doubt, and I I have I'm pretty confident that they have no choice, no choice but to co-opt. Or, or use the same methods as Swell does. They will be going to compilers before you know before you know it, because there is no alternative. They, the only way to survive for them is to take the ideas from Swell and incorporate them. But wouldn't that make React as good as Swell or better? The answer is no, because it has all the baggage of history, and um, Swell has less of that or none. I, I would say, especially when you are writing compilers, you know. You can move faster. You can move in a much uh, controlled manner. You can even say Svelte actually gives you suggestions when it is compiling. You know that okay, well maybe you don't want to do it this way, and it gives you alternatives. Runtime cannot do that for you, right? Um, all right. So now th let's dive into the technical case for Svelte. A, this will be somewhat of a recap of things, but let's go through it anyways. It's easier to understand that because there is less to learn. Not because there is less, but there is less to learn and there is less to read and understand. It's just standard HTML, CSS, JavaScript with, with small extensions here and there, like dollar sign and so on and so forth. Um, the component local state, so you can, you just mutate state. You don't have to do all that use state and use selector and use this and use that uh, or bind uh, map state, map dispatch. Uh, comp so if you want component local state, Put it in in the local variables of the component. If you want to uh, want parent to provide some state, some data, the parent can either pass it through um, props. But if if you want to go several levels deep, right, uh, such that uh, you know, let's say user session information that you want to access, you know, the parent A has child B, has child C, has child D. Now, from if you want to pass something from A to D, you're not going to go through props all the way, right? So that's why you can set context in parent and then get context in uh, child or descendant. Global st uh, state is made up of stores, uh, which are observables that anyone can subscribe to. In fact, using dollar store syntax, you don't even have to subscribe or unsubscribe. You're accessing the value directly in a very reactive manner. Two-way binding makes all kinds of programming simpler. Uh, for example, form processing, which I showed in my example, I said, uh, 
bind value equal to obj dot name. Imagine how much simpler your life becomes when you are doing forms, because in React you you are do using a, you know on change some uh, um, some handler, right? You are not doing that here. You are just assigning, and then you you only have one callback form on colon submit. That's it. That's the one the one callback you you'll be calling, and the form on submit will basically. It already has the data because OBJ that you bound all over your input fields, right, throughout the form is already up to date. That's it. It has the new values. So yes, two-way binding is a, is a big deal, huge benefit. No need for reducers, action creators, hooks, thunk like middleware, etc. It just works, you know. You reassign a value asynchronously and it re-renders. So less code, less surface area, fewer bugs. Of course, that is a restatement of above. What else can I mention? Well, there is hardly anything left to cover because that's the beauty of Svelte. There is the surface <laughs> so little to learn that it, it you kind of run out of things to say, other than you know gushing about it. So faster code. So this is there is no virtual DOM, which means and and again, don't take my word for it. Look at the benchmarks if you believe in benchmarks, or just write your own code and see. Right in both the both the frameworks. Then the it's not a, it's a compiler. So why is the code faster? Because com compiler at build time can optimize the heck out of your code. Um, smaller bundles again because it's a compiler. It helps uh, because if you look at the bundles that are generated, the basic hello world was was three kilobytes, not gzipped. Um, React on the, even a hello world would be you know you know tens if not hundreds of kilobytes so that's there so th there are some uh, uh, very strong technical case to be made which in turn supports the business case any questions uh, any so you uh, max you mentioned uh, you know what was your con yeah support basically big company support so we we discussed that are there any other related questions which which get in the way of justifying Okay, I'm glad you asked. Uh, Svelte, server-side rendering is the first class citizen in Svelte. All Svelte frameworks, whether it is Sapper, Svelte itself, if you're just doing plain Svelte, um, or you're using Sapper, all of them, Svelte is written with server-side rendering in mind from the very beginning, which means um, they even have the concept of hydration, where the first initial mount uh, rendering happens on the server and then that server side rendered with all the fully fleshed out HTML page comes to the browser and now at that point it gets hydrated as in all subsequent user actions or browser events they can still happen and all the callbacks for those or reactions to those happen inside the browser. So yes, uh, that means you got best of both worlds. Your SEO is handled if a web bot or a crawler comes calling then your server side rendering is serving it even when the human comes and visits your site in a browser the first render is on the server side and all subsequent uh, change events or changes in state will happen in the browser and the reaction or reactivity to that will happen in the browser also okay so there is swelt native there is uh, basically all these projects they simply simply took um, native script and you can you know native script will take any javascript framework and of course it needs a lot of work but somebody has already done that work so there is self swelt native you can do that um, although a lot of people are falling out of love with react native also but any case um, an equivalent case does exist so at this point i think we should break for lunch and um, um, be, during lunch i would recommend everyone to install and do the the first project that uh, npx dig it uh, swell js slash template and then your hello or whatever project name do that do npm install that in that run the dev server uh, when you do all those things so that way after lunch we can do some live coding and and some interesting i have a, a very interesting app to show you which uses uh, which is completely serverless written in Svelte, um and it it basically it's a progressive web app and you'll see some interesting things. 
in there. Let me just uh, quickly demo it and we will get into the code etc later. So here, wait, where is that? Actually, um, I'll just go there, which is swelled.spinspire.com. This app is actually hosted in, uh, in on Firebase and um, it's a Swelt written app and it is also a progressive web app and that is the reason why you see this plus sign. So if you actually go with your phone to this app, um, it will it'll prompt you, if it is especially Android, even Apple does but Android has better support for PWS, it will say um, add to um, whatever, uh, your home screen. And let me just show you, uh, oops sorry, you, uh, this app has a few things implemented. Uh, it has uh, authentication through Google. So you can click on sign in and it will do that. And here it, I can edit my blog post records. But before I can do that, it says you must sign in first, which I will. And this is just a sample post. So let me just demo this quickly to you. I click sign in. You can try this on your phone. And it says, hey, uh, so it's doing authentication through Google. And I'm going to say, yes, use Spinspire, Jitesh has Spinspire. Now I got signed in. It has my profile picture, my name, email also is somewhere in there. You could sign out. Um, and there is something going on with the JavaScript here. Uh, oops, I, let me do this again. Uh, right. My service worker, so is not as perfect as I would like it to be. But anyway, so if I say um, Svelte demo is the name of my article, uh, lots of words. Right, and I can assign the type and whatever. And when I did that, it showed up here. If you had this particular site open, it would have shown up on your, because this is, I'm using Firebase Firestore. So uh, there is WebSocket magic going on, which shows up on everyone's. Um, so let me just sh uh, show that. I mean, obviously, I mean, you've seen it, but why not? Um, oops, sorry. The so yeah, so the same, and if I modify this, click on this, and uh, yeah, and I, I change some, let's say title, uh, it saved, showed up in the, on the right hand side in real time. Uh, but here's the fun part. Um, Max, can you turn on the, the, the light? I'm going to go to the same place myself. And uh, let's take a picture. Because I just want to show you that uh, file uploads, etc. And th those two in real time are happening there. So if I click on this and I say, I yeah, that's all right. So let's take a picture. Uh, it's not being recorded, but let's see. Um, so I'm taking this picture. All right, let's see. And pay attention to the browser here. Once I hit save, that's the picture we just took, showed up in both the browsers. So, that it's, uh, I, mean, I mean, most of this is a Firebase magic, of course, but, uh, but there is a, um, the basic um, toolkit that comes with fi Firebase um, is very easy to use, integrate with Svelte. There are higher level, I'm, I'm using basic toolkit from Firebase, but there, are, there is Svelte fi Firebase um, component uh, or project already going on. So we will, we will get into, into the code of this. It has um, manifest JSON and uh, service worker and HTTPS everything in place. Therefore, that's why it can be used as a progressive web app. All right, we'll do that after lunch. Let's break for lunch for now. Any questions before we go to lunch? Cool, all right, see you after lunch.